All right. Let me just position this perfectly. All right, cool. So today I'm going to talk about building JavaScript tools that you might not have known were, it was possible for you to build. Uh, so I want to make sure that people uh, understand a lot of the potential uh, that's out there. So quickly, uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I work at, at Addvis, so that means I do a lot of third-party JavaScript. And a shout out to my coworkers. I was not there today, obviously, and they released their new product, Addvis Pro, so shout out to them. Uh, besides my day job as a JavaScript engineer, I, work, I do a lot of open source work. Uh, I'm going to demonstrate one of the open source projects that I've been working on uh, the past three or four months that relates to this talk. Um, and I try to uh, speak as often as I can, meetups, things like that. Uh, I also wrote a short required JS book last year. So I've been heavy into the AMD side of things. Um, but to get started, uh, JavaScript tools is very general. So what types of tools are we talking about? And so what I'm going to talk about today are static code analysis tools. So did anyone go to Aria's talk? I, the first talk of the day was in the same. Yeah, so Aria's talk is going to be kind of similar. He kind of uh, made the building block. And I'm going to show you uh, a lot of different stuff that you can do. And hopefully, uh, you don't need to be like a genius to do this stuff at all. Aria is very smart. But you do not need to uh, be like that. So what do these tools typically do? Um, static code analysis tools, they usually analyze code, uh, whether it be code performance, it could be code maintainability, it could be just code validation. Uh, they analyze things. Um, they can also generate code for transpilers, uh, minifiers, visualizers, a lot of different things you can do with static code analysis. So yes, I can provide some examples of uh, static code analysis tools that you probably have used. Uh, the first one I'm going to mention is Uglify.js. If you use Node.js as your build system, uh, you're probably using Uglify.js. You could use you know, comp uh, Clojure compiler. You could use a bunch of other uh, minifiers. But Uglify uh, reduces the size of your code by minifying it and optimizing it. And it does that uh, as it's basically a, a static code analysis tool. Uh, JS hint. Um, I know me personally, I use JS hint with my Sublime uh, setup, so I get everything JS hinted when I type, sort of change my life to find any issues uh, that I could potentially have with my JavaScript code before it's too late or it's in production and then I have to make a hot fix and uh, it's just terrible. I don't like breaking the internet. Like I said, I work for uh, Add This and we're on 15 million sites, so I don't want to make a syntax error in my JavaScript code that breaks your site, potentially. CSS Lint is very similar uh, to JS Hint in that it's going to tell you, is there potentially anything wrong with the CSS that you're writing? So it's analyzing all of your CSS code and telling you, uh, giving you feedback on it. All right, so CoffeeScript. I uh, am not a CoffeeScript fanboy. There are people out there that love CoffeeScript, and it's, you know, a lot of people use it. Um, but it, it's a transpiler, right? It basically compiles to JavaScript. So uh, that's an example of something that analyzes your code and converts your code to JavaScript. Play-Doh uh, is an example. And that's a, this is a visualization, a code complexity visualization example. Aria also talked about this. right? It'll look at each one of your files, and it'll tell you, is this file too complex? Is there the potential for there to be errors? What about the maintainability of your files? Which, which file is most likely to be unmaintainable? That's an example of a static code analysis tool. All right, one of my favorites, the RequireJS optimizer. If you use AMD, and you probably, a lot of people do, you probably have lots of different AMD files, and it's pretty common that you want to package up your app or your library into one file. So the RequireJS optimizer will figure out your dependency tree within your code, and it'll make sure that all of your dependencies are, are put in that file in the correct order so that nothing bombs. Very cool. Uh, AMD Clean, so this is the project that I had referenced earlier. This is the project I've been working on. It will convert AMD code to regular JavaScript code so that you do not need an AMD loader. You don't need an AMD shim uh, because all it's, all it's doing is it's finding your code and then it's compiling it to JavaScript. We'll look at an example of that at the end. 
uh, Browserify, I'm not gonna, I don't want any common JS people to be angry with me, so I'll include Browserify. It will allow you to write in a common JS format, right? You'll have multiple common JS files, and then you'll be able to bring all those, your entire project into one file that can be used in the browser. It's a very powerful technique, um, and it's another example. It's very common. So, have you used the static code analysis tool? I'm not gonna make you guys raise your hands because I'm assuming that you have. You probably use something, whether it's a minifier, uh, whether it's something like JS Hint, you've probably used it. I, I, get, I don't have not met a developer who hasn't, a JavaScript developer who hasn't, even not a JavaScript developer. So the question of my talk now really is, have you written a static code analysis tool? So who has? Just curious, I will make you raise your hand. I see one person. One person. Anyone else? Have you written a static code analysis tool? All right, that's what I thought. My assumption was correct. You probably haven't. And so why is that? Why haven't you? I also have a theory about why you haven't. You don't know where to start. I had, just me, me telling you this, I had no idea where to start. Um, I wanted to create this AMD clean project because I didn't want to have to include my a an AMD library to use AMD. And I didn't know where to start to create that. I thought, should I use regular expressions? I don't really love regular expressions. They can become very hairy to look at. So what do I do? Like, is there a technique I could use? Uh, so I figured something out. I, someone on Twitter gave me a hint, and I started researching. And so I want to provide you with the same information. Uh, let's, change, um, let's change your understanding about what you can do. So all right, let's get started. Static code analysis basics. Every static code analysis tool needs some input. That input is gonna be a string of code, right? This is a very basic example. This is creating a variable, and this is saying this variable called code is gonna be a string. That string represents a function declaration called jqcon. So that's, that's simple enough, right? You could do that in your everyday JavaScript land. So, the interesting part is when you take that string of code and you convert it to an object that actually means something. If you look at this object, keep in mind this object represents the string that we just looked at. So what does this object tell us? It tells us the type of this string. It's a function declaration, which I mentioned before. It tells us the identifier name. So what, is, what do we call this function declaration? Well, I called it jqcon. That's awesome. So did I pass any arguments? Are there any potential arguments to my function that I had in my string? There weren't, so you'll see that params property is set to an empty array. If I had set an argument in my function, it would say, hey, whatever the identifier was for the argument, it would list that uh, in the array indice. So because this is uh, an empty function, there was nothing inside of it, that's what the body uh, property tells you. There, the body, the nested body, that tells you what is inside of that function declaration. Nothing. Nothing's inside of it, it's an empty array. And like I said, this is a function declaration which is different from a function expression. So it's not an expression, just some handy metadata to have, uh, potentially. And this object is great, right? You guys are so pumped about seeing this object. It's so cool. Uh, it's called an AST or an abstract syntax tree. So an abstract syntax, syntax tree sounds very academic. And when I first heard it from someone on Twitter, I was like, I'm not gonna do that. That sounds way too intense. I don't, I'm not, you know, I'm an academic person, but I'm not that academic. It scares people. The reality is, if you're in JavaScript land, which in our talk, it's just an object. It gives you lots of cool data. So it's not scary. I go a little bit more into the abstract syntax tree. It's an object. Trees, trees sound scary. I like thinking, them, thinking of them as objects that represent the structure of your code. So think if that function declaration that I showed, if there was a, a nested function declaration inside of it, that object would show you that actual structural representation. It'll show you how your code is structured. So part of the name is abstract, and that means that not, that not everything is stored. So syntax stuff. I don't, the example I, I gave was, a JavaScript function that it starts and ends with an opening and closing curly bracket, it doesn't store that, it doesn't, it doesn't care. Okay, so uh, that's why it's called an abstract syntax tree. And there's a lot of potential when you have a JavaScript object with a lot of data 
which you guys probably already know. Uh, it can be traversed and it can be updated. All right, some common AST questions. Again, why would I ever want to use an AST? Maybe you want to analyze your code. If you're in this talk, you might potentially want to use an AST, just a guess, uh, potentially. So like I had, I had mentioned regular expressions before, and regular expressions are dumb. Uh, you can only get so far with them, and they're notoriously ugly. Uh, some, some people go very far with regular expressions. Um, I, on the other hand, like readable code, and in my opinion, you see a program with lots of regular expressions over and over again. It's, it's very tough for me to read. Um, so how do I generate an AST? That's the question, because that's the part I skipped over. I showed you the conversion, but how do you get there? So how do you generate that object? The answer is you use a parser library or you write your own JavaScript parser. There's two options. That's usually the case for pretty much anything, any code that you write. Am I going to use code that someone else wrote or am I going to write it myself? So in this talk, I'm going to go over code that other people have written that will make your life so much easier. Uh, so let's generate an AST. A Sprema. Aria mentioned this. Uh, it is a JavaScript parser written in JavaScript and it will generate an AST for you. It's an amazing project, and the project itself is a, is a building block for so many other projects. It's really the core foundation of a lot of these static code analysis tools. It's a great thing that you can, uh, you know, follow, he follows, Aria follows the UMD pattern, right? So that means that it can be used in both a Node.js or a web environment. You're not limited to just Node, although a lot of my examples are gonna reference the Node common JS sort of syntax. And it adheres to the Mozilla SpiderMonkey parser API. This basically means what the, the object should look like. What properties should the object have? It's a standard so that you can reference that standard when you're actually in your code base. You're like, hmm, I have a function declaration. So that means I know that there's going to be a type property. And that's going to be, that's going to say function declaration. That's how you know it's a function declaration when you're iterating that object. So it's a. Um, it's good. It's good. It's a great reference. And like I said, it's uh, created by Aria, uh, who has also made um, a bunch of other open source things that have been great, PhantomJS being one of them. All right. So let's get into some code. Uh, generating an AST with a Sprema. Just like before, I have the same code variable, which is the same string. It's just a function declaration. I'm showing the Node.js style of syntax. That means that I'm just requiring a Sprema, uh, the library. So I'm storing uh, this, the Sprema. Uh, I think it's a function. It might be an object. I don't remember. Um, I think it's a function. I'm storing the Sprema function. And then basically, I'm storing a variable called AST, which is my AST. And the way that I'm grabbing it is I'm calling the Sprema.parse method. And I'm passing it my string of code. And it's that simple. You have the AST, that object that we first looked at. That's being generated by that Sprema.parse. It's very simple. It's pretty awesome that you can get that that easily. And keep in mind, I have a lot of all the code examples, or most of them, I have uh, either on require bin or uh, JS bin. So you can go back to this presentation. You can look at it. You can mess around with it. Uh, it's up to you. But I'm not going to click on each individual one of those. So that is great. It works. ASTs are so cool. That's what I thought, at least. Uh, so. I still have a few questions, though, about Esprima. I don't really, so we, we just kind of barely talked about it. What are some common Esprima questions? First off, do, you, do I have to use Esprima? Like, why? Why am I using Esprima? No, like, you don't have to use Esprima. I will say it's battle tested. It's been around for a while, and a lot of other modules use it. Um, there are popular alternatives. The one I mentioned here is Acorn, and that's the AST that is used for Uglify.js. Right, so I mentioned Uglify.js as an example of a static code analysis tool, but it doesn't use a Sprema. It uses its own built-in uh, JavaScript parser called Acorn. So the other question is, so I heard about this, you know, from Mozilla SpiderMonkey parser API. Why does it use that? And I kind of touched on it before. It's really developed as the standard among static code analysis tools. A lot of tools are adhering to this standard. So that's really the reason you want to use it. You want to be compliant with other tools, right? You don't want to like, you don't want certain tools not to be able to be able to be used with your library. So you want one format. That's really what you want. 
And this is, this is the one format that people are really using. All right, so what now? We just generated our AST. What's the next step? Well, let's traverse that object and potentially update it. Keep in mind, if you're just doing analysis, you can just traverse it and get some data about the program right, inside of your object. That's all you'll need. But uh, you might also want to regenerate code and do advanced things like that. There's a lot of possibilities. So let's look at first how we would traverse our AST. So we're really standing on the shoulders of giants here because I mentioned a Sprema to generate my AST, and now we're going to talk about ES Traverse, which is also a JavaScript library. Now, ES Traverse provides some pretty badass methods uh, for traversing and updating an AST object. It can also be used in a Node.js or web environment, and it as well uh, adheres to the SpiderMonkey parser API, which is great, right? Because uh, Sprema does and ES Traverse does, and they all work together peacefully without erring. And it's created, I always try to do shout outs to uh, maintainers of really awesome open source work. And Yusuke, I hope I'm not butchering your name, but he's done a lot of work uh, in this sort of JavaScript realm. So very appreciative of the work that he's done makes my life and many others much easier. So let's look at some examples. Uh, traversing an AST with ES Traverse. ES Traverse, uh, you'll notice that I'm requiring it just like I did a Sprema in the Node.js sort of syntax way. And then I'm using this ES Traverse .traverse method. And all of my first argument that I'm passing is my object, which we saw before, is that function declaration. And then I pass an object as my second argument, and I have an enter and a leave uh, properties. And they're both functions. Pretty much the enter gets called. You, you'll notice that my in my enter uh, functions, the node and parent are my arguments. So that means that any time uh, ES Traverse will traverse every single node in your object, every single property, and then it'll give you whatever that node or object property is. Um, and the leave will, it's another hook that you can use. After all the child nodes um, have been uh, traversed, then you can, then the, the leave property uh, will be executed and it'll pass you the node and the parent of that node. All right, so not only can you traverse, because uh, we weren't doing anything in our enter and our leave hooks, you can also update an AST with ES Traverse. And the first way you can do that, there are two ways that I know of that you can do it. You can still use the traverse method, and right now I'm only showing you the enter hook. And because uh, ES Traverse passes us the node, the current node being iterated on, we can check to see what's up with that node. And in my example, I'm just checking to see what the type is and what the name is. So if I had a lot of code, hopefully uh, my if statement, it would only go inside of my if statement if the identifier was jqcon, right? If that's the only function, or if that's the only identifier with that name, um, that's the only thing going, going into my if statement. So what I'm doing is, if I find an identifier that's named jqcon, I'm changing that node's name to be jqcon, which is the name already, underscore is underscore awesome. So I'm actually changing the name of that identifier in the object itself. So you don't have to use the traverse method. Uh, the replace method can be used instead, and, and I guess it can be a little bit cleaner way if you actually want to update your AST. The only difference, this is the very same code example, the only difference is instead of acting directly on that node that gets passed to me, Whatever object that I return inside of my enter, uh, my enter function, that automatically replaces the current node. So it's a little bit simpler. Instead of saying like node.name equals, I actually return an object with the different name. Uh, you can tell it's a little bit cleaner as opposed to doing string concatenation, which I was doing in the previous slide. Just two different ways. They both work. Uh, it's up to you. So this is so awesome. It works. This works too. Traversing and updating ASTs is just easy. This is all easy, like a piece of cake. Like you didn't, I didn't know this was possible. But what, like what's so great about, all right, so I updated my object. Um, what's so great about it? But before we get to that, I got ahead of myself a little bit. Uh, let's, let's talk about some common ES Traverse questions. Uh, again, do I have to use ES Traverse? No, you don't have to. Uh, again, you could write your own, or you could, um, there's a popular alternative called ES Query, which uses sort of syntax that's very similar to CSS selectors. It's kind of cool. It's a cool project. I've personally not used it, 
but um, I know the person who maintains it, and he's very well uh, regarded. So most likely it's pretty good. Uh, and this is the question I just asked as well, you know. But couldn't I traverse and update the AST myself? Do I need ES Traverse for this? Um, AST traversing is pretty tricky. There isn't a unified interface for each node. So my example here is a variable declaration um, has nested children within a declarations property. When an if statement is going to have uh, the nested children within a consequent property. So you kind of have to work out, you know, oh, if this, if that, if then. So you have to work out all those uh, conditions. And ES Traverse has handled that for you. So it's up to you if uh, you want to do it just for learning's sake or if you want to make a, a competitor to ES Traverse, you know, have at it. But I myself have not uh, wanted to do that. All right, so let's review some stuff. Sprema generates our object. ES Traverse uh, will loop through our object and allows us to update our object. What else is there? All right, we've, we've generated, traversed, and updated our AST or our, our object. Let's generate some code. You guys are so pumped. <laughs> so so uh, the, next, the next giant that we're going to use is ES, ES CodeGen. ES CodeGen is a JavaScript library that will generate, a code, will generate code from an AST. So it's the opposite direction of a Sprema, right, which generates an AST or an object from your string of code. It goes, it's the different direction. Uh, this is very, we've seen this before. It can be used in both environments, Node.js and a web environment. We've seen this too. It also adheres to the SpiderMonkey parser API. These all adhere to the same format, which is why they can be used together. Very cool. It's created by the same guy. A lot of these uh, really awesome static code analysis tools have been created by similar people. Um, so we need more people uh, to get involved in this sort of aspect of uh, JavaScript programming. All right, let's generate some code. And this example is, is very boring, right? So all it's doing is it's generating the AST. And we've, we've, left, we've left ES Traverse off of this example just for the sake of having all the code on, one, uh, on the screen without having to scroll. But all it's doing, it is taking the string of code, turning that into an object, and then it's going the exact opposite way by calling the escodegen.parse. And it's turning that object back into a string. That's, that's all there is to it. Like, there's, there are very simple APIs at a, at a high level, uh, which is pretty awesome. There's powerful things you can do with this. Like, that is amazing. You know, generating code from an AST is hot. That is nice. But again, I have some more questions. Uh, I'm not so sure about this ES code gen thing. Do I have to use it? Everyone always asks that. Do I have to use it? Good question. I don't know. Because uh, I'm not sure of a good alternative. I don't know. Does anyone know of a good alternative to ES code gen? Anyone? I don't know if Ari is in here. He might be the best person to ask. I haven't found any good alternatives. Um, let's see. Couldn't I write an ASD code generator myself? You can always do that. You can always do that. But I will see you guys next year when you're done, because it's going to take you forever, forever. And we want to get stuff done, right? Like, that's why you use jQuery. You want to get stuff done. jQuery helps in that. So let's review everything again. A Sprema generates an object from code. ES Traverse allows you to traverse and update that object. ES Code Gen allows you to have that object and convert it to a string of code. It's really awesome when you combine these three uh, open source projects together. You can make really powerful things. All right, some wrap up questions. So all my examples have really shown a very high level API. Right? I haven't delved into some crazy things we want to make. Uh, do you have any more complex examples? And this is where uh, I was going to show the project that I've been working on. And you'll, I'll, sh I'll point out each individual part that we've, uh, we've learned and how they've applied to this project. So I already have it set up here. Uh, AMD Clean is the project that I've referenced uh, a couple times in this presentation. And all it does, it converts AMD code to standard JavaScript code. So let's remember, this is the input. This is the code, right? So basically, I'm creating an AST based off of this. I'm traversing an AST. And then I'm using ES code gen to print this code on the right, which is supposed to be the standard JavaScript code. So if we actually write some things, uh, the example I give is, you know what? I'm going to make an AMD module. And I'm going to give it a module ID. 
of example two. Normally, there, if you're using like required JS, it'll automatically populate that module ID for you. You normally don't want to list the module ID. The optimizer will do that for you. But for the sake of showing this demo, I'm going to say I'm going to create a module called example two. I'm going to say it's going to depend on my first example module. And then let's see. I'll give it a callback function. And good, it returned undefined. It returns undefined, right, because nothing is getting returned in my callback function. So I've written all this code with a Sprema, ES Traverse, and ES Code Gen, and I can do all sorts of crazy things. I can say, you know what, this is an empty callback. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna return undefined by default. You know what, what if we had something in there? What if we return, I don't know, true? That's not true, that's true. All right, so if we, if we return true, it's, n it's no longer undefined. You'll see that all my AST logic is saying is, you know what, there's a dependency there. So, not, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to transform that define into an immediately evoked function. And I'm going to pass my dependency, and I'm assuming uh, that dependency is above um, my current module. So I automatically pass it. It doesn't matter if you have more than one dependency. You know, you can have callback functions, it'll change the name automatically. There's a lot of crazy things you can do with code regeneration. So this is a very basic example of a transpiler, right? It's like, think about it, you can write, you, you could write something like CoffeeScript. It's that easy to write something so powerful. It wasn't, this is all, all AMD clean is under a thousand lines. It's like 900 lines of code. It's not like crazy uh, amounts of code, which is why I wanted to give it as an example. Um, because I, I pinpointed, I give the website example, but I also listed the source if you want to look through that. And if you go through this presentation, you'll notice this is all very similar. Okay, he's using ES Traverse, he's using ES Cogen, he's using a Sprema, and these are all really easy things to do. Imagine the possibilities. Oh, I want to write something which detects global variables being accidentally exposed in my scripts. Like, would you ever write that before if you didn't know this, all, that all this technology was there? Probably not. Uh, I know I wouldn't. So this has opened up like a completely new world of uh, tools to write. And so it's very exciting. Uh, there are more and more tools like this being made. And it's an exciting time. So I was so excited, I want to share it with you. But uh, one other thing is I didn't cover CSS static analysis. I've only been covering JavaScript, right? So you can do this in CSS as well. I had mentioned CSS lint as an example of a, st a static code analysis tool. and so. I have two minutes left, so I'm not going to delve into it. But what I'll say is I, I wrote up a very quick example. This is on JS bin. And I wrote up a quick example of how, actually this is on required bin. A very quick example about how you could, um, if you're using the display inline block, and say you want to support IE6 and 7, which don't have display inline block, you want to make sure that that automatically gets generated for you. I just wrote like a 10 to 15 line thing, which will just automatically put it in the source code and then regenerates the source code. So that's an example of I analyzed my, uh, my CSS code, I created an AST for my CSS code, I traversed my CSS code, and keep in mind, traversing CSS is actually way easier than JavaScript. So don't be, don't be like, oh, it's probably, I have to learn new things. No, it's, it's pretty easy, it's pretty easy. So a lot of cool libraries out there that help you. But I, you only have to use like one as opposed to the three that I'm using for JavaScript. But yes, last thing, are there any more resources you would recommend? So when you start getting into this stuff, uh, there's going to be two things that you're going to be obsessed with. You're going to be obsessed with the Esprima uh, parser demo page, like obsessed. You're going to be there all the time. I wonder what my time on page was for that. It's ridiculous amounts of time. You're going to spend there, and then you're going to spend a lot of time uh, the Mozilla docs for the SpiderMonkey parser API. So those two things will become your best friends, right? You're going to lose friends. No, you won't. But you, <laughs> these will be your best friends. You're going to be using it all the time, and they're great. Uh, there's so much help when you're creating programs like this. So that's all I got. Thank you guys for listening, and I hope you make tools like this in the future. Thank you.